face the difficulties of today and tomorrow. I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. This nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Hello and welcome to episode 14 of the Policy Dialogue Series with alumni, staff, faculty, and students from the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. The views expressed do not represent official positions of the school or alumni network. Our goal is to discuss specific policy solutions that can address and solve the current local, national, and international challenges we face. We are recording this on February 9th, 2021. My name is Evan Papp and I graduated with the class of 2011 with a focus on international security and economic policy. And I'm the executive producer of Empathy Media Lab, which publishes content on labor, political economy, arts, and culture. Joining me is fellow alumni, Emmanuel Sule. Emmanuel has over 15 years research experience on natural resource governance, large scale land acquisitions, wildlife management, and rural livelihoods. His work has been published in the journals of Sustainable Tourism, Peasant Studies, Development and Environment, and in several book chapters on tourism and agricultural commercialization in Africa. He also received his master's in public policy from the University of Maryland School of Public Policy to focus on environmental policy. And he hails from the great country of Tanzania. Manuel, long time, great to see you. Evan, it's really great to join you, and uh, it's a really amazing session, and I look forward to this discussion today. Could you talk about your background and how you first got interested in policy and why you think others should care about public policy? It's really great. Uh, I grew up in a remote area of Tanzania where the basic activity is a farming. Being a son of a, of a farmer, I've always dreamed of studying something that will change lives. Lives of my rural communities, lives of many so people in living in rural areas in Tanzania. So I grew up studying sciences and I thought I would be a medical doctor. After years of articulating what I want to change, I thought I should study economics because then I can understand what people need and how we can supply such needs or meet such needs. But later on, I went and discovered that it is the public policy that actually changed our lives. So I decided to quit after my undergrad studies in economics and decided to study public policy so that we can shape policies, not only at the national level, but more importantly, at the grassroots level. So this has always been the heart uh, of my thinking on how we can develop, particularly the poor communities in rural areas where there's abundant natural resources, but they are not well governed, they are not well utilized. Great, so a lot of people may not be familiar with what natural resource governance is, and can you provide an overview of this uh, sector? Natural resources in African context is really the heart of everything. Natural resources start with land and all resources attached to land, that is forestry, pasture, and water, and then to some degree, minerals. The way people access land, the people use land, the governance structures from policy to legal and institutional infrastructure that govern natural resources affects daily lives of rural people in Africa. Therefore, getting the administration right, gave, getting everybody access, giving access to everybody to use land, to use pasture, is at the heart of development programs in Africa. Where people have access to basic resources like land, lives have changed. And in places where people have been denied access to basic resources like land, people's lives have changed and they are miserable. And in African countries, independencies were fought because people suffered such injustices of accessing basic resources, which were altered during the colonial administration. 
So for anyone who wants to make changes in an African context, the first focus should always be in shaping policies that govern natural resources and address injustices of colonial administration in Africa. So my short time in Zambia, it seemed like oftentimes land was through a leasing process of 99 years. And I think that may have also, I'm, I'm not exactly sure of the historical precedent with that. Within the US, uh, they do have the these more public or these private uh, property deeds. Uh, could you talk a little bit about Tanzania, what the process is and are people able to hold land uh, indefinitely or is it more of a, a lease system? In many African countries, Tanzania, Zambia, Mozambique, land is a public asset. It is entrusted into the president and people literally have a user right, not ownership in the sense of ownership because people own resources in countries like United States or in European countries. And the essence is that if you leave land in the hands of private individuals, there are consequences where the wealthy will grab even one third of the country and leaving the majority of the people landless. So the founding fathers of these countries, particularly Nyerere, was very much concerned that we can't sell land as a piece of cloth. Rather, land should remain on the hands of the state so that it can be distributed equally. But this has both advantage and disadvantage to the rural population. The leadership changes and people's attitudes towards public, publicly trusted resources change. During the independence struggles and the early years of independency, land was used wisely where president were not accumulating land and the people benefited from access of land. So in countries like Zambia and Tanzania where people had access to land, their life are quite different from countries like South Africa where 80% of fertile land were taken by only 20% of the white population that uses such land. So the poor, the majority, 80% of the population remain with tiny marginal land that they couldn't farm on. But as development grow, population grow, people are now noticing that even actually leaving land into the hands of the state is not even sufficient. They need more safeguards because now we also get people who are greedy within the system that also tend to incorporate or grab more land and use for individual benefits and also allocate to large scale investors. So these are critical issues that are emerging and that needs now a change uh, on how you actually access and allocate land in countries in Africa. So I wanna to turn to a series of articles that you wrote titled a uh, corridor mini series, accumulation and contested commercialization in Tanzania. So could you talk about the Southern Agricultural Growth Corridor of Tanzania, which is a public private partnership aimed at producing inclusive, commercially successful agribusinesses that will benefit the region's small scale farmers? That's an interesting subject. Tanzania, as many African countries are doing, Tanzania has been adopting many initiatives at the national level, at the regional level, and at the international level. What it tries to do is to combine national initiative to regional and international initiative. And the core of this is to attract more foreign investment. So the Southern Agriculture Growth Corridor of Tanzania was established by the fourth government of President Kikote as a center as a geographical location where investments in agriculture will be promoted, where investors will be given land and they will partner with local farmers to produce, be it rice, be it sugar, be it chicken, so that those investments have a trickle down effect that the investment reach the smallholder farmers or the smallholder farmers have access to technology, access to capital, have access to infrastructure. So the whole process was informed by consultation from international consultant, donor community, 
The whole idea of the growth corridor was presented at the World Economic Forum in Switzerland. But the problem is, despite all the good intentions that uh, this corridor has, if one will want, you can locate within the literature of James Scott of grand schemes. It's a big idea where you want to make a big change, but literally missing out the elements of how natural resources are contested at the local and the national level. So when you're designing grand schemes like these big schemes, you have to understand how such schemes, which you articulate in paper, once they hit the ground, they will be unraveled because there are contestation among the communities. Even though politicians want them to be done and rightly done yes, as fast as they can because of the contestation, literally because of land rights that are held by the rural communities and who are rightly afraid that if their land is given to foreigners or foreign investors, then they will lose out in such investments. They contest it. So what is happening and what I covered in my articles is that when these grant schemes are not well articulated, are not well informed by the rural masses, uh, in a nutshell, you can call them, if these initiatives are not bottom up, they are top down, then they are likely not to achieve their desired goals and intentions because they will face a lot of resistance and therefore along the way, they will be reshaped because the communities want to benefit more and they don't just want to let their resources abused or lose, uh, lost out. Therefore, what we are seeing is that in a corridor like Sagot, government actually, uh, re, what I can call it, they, they, they realize that they need to reframe the whole corridor idea and the whole agreements. For instance, now the government has already uh, called and uh, cancel some of the agreement it were, were made with the World Bank so that the whole process could be reviewed and the whole allocation of grants to private investors could be rethink, uh, rethought so that at least the whole process has benefits and the communities have a control over the infrastructure like roads, warehouses that will be built so that at least uh, there will be a benefit at the community level and at the national level. So we feel like some of these uh, initiatives need to be articulated, not only in the academic uh, debate, but also at the community level. And we see changes are happening. Just an observation, taking a step back, I think trying to get to the agreement that the goal of all these policies is to try to get the communities, both at the local and then national governments self-sufficient, sovereign, and independent so that they can do their own internal growth. So that would require the ability to even manufacture farm equipment, to have the capacity to build all of the transportation, whether it be rail and roads, to be able to build the irrigation systems, uh, to, to make sure that the, the agricultural crop is, is watered year round to make sure that the uh, engineering of whether it's seeds and everything else. So all of that requires a lot of capital coming in to get to the point where you generate surplus capital that you can then reinvest yourself and, and change the entire trade deficit. And it, it's always the challenge of trying to figure out how to get there while oftentimes there's gonna be international investors that only care about one thing, which is to get their profits extracted out. And so I, I think it's so important the work that you're doing right now to, to really make sure that the, the communities and the countries that you're looking at um, are, are not just being, you know, asset stripped or something like that, you know, as a history often can go. So another article in the series is titled Lack of Policy Implementation Holds Back Women's Land Rights in Africa. Could you provide an overview of the challenges women face in obtaining land rights? Women's land rights in Africa today is a top in the agenda. It is discussed at the African continental level, at the national level, and at the community level. And it's rightly so because women in Africa are marginalized in accessing productive resources. 
particularly land and any other ass assets attached to land. And this has uh, traditional implications. Uh, women traditionally do not own land. When women are, or a, a woman is married in Africa, it is expected that she will gain resources belonging to her husband. So she doesn't move with a piece of a resource from the family where she was born. Therefore, what we are seeing is that there are a lot of pressure in recent times where there's increase in large scale land acquisition for large scale investments in Africa. Therefore, the traditionally marginalized women are facing another onslaught on their little rights they have or the little access they have on land resources. That's why land is so important to women development in Africa, because in places where women have access to land or in families or in households where women have access to land, they have really uh, produced not only food crops that their families consume, but the surplus cash crops that they use to improve their welfare. But what we also see is that in African continent, where governance of natural resources, including land, has been shaped by the colonial administration, there's a lot of legal pluralism. So there's no consistency. You have done reform and land laws that provide for protection of women's access and use of land. But again, the Marriage Act does not uh, provide for equal access for both men and women. Therefore, we find that Africa needs to do consistent reforms that provide and safeguard women's land rights. Because doing reform in one set of laws does not help if the other sets of laws take away such rights. So what we are trying to do is to help understand these complexities, publish them, and inform debates that are relevant in African continent. And plus, in partnership with other active organizations like Oxfam International, and other community-based organizations have partnered to carry out big projects in Africa looking into women's land rights and how we can shape African uh, countries to implement good guidelines and frameworks that provide for and protect women's land rights. And uh, I, what we also see is that because the customary laws are also important, these customary laws are not in papers they're inherited from one generation to the other, and one community has different uh, perspectives and different provisions at the customary level. And what we are also seeing is that in Africa, uh, ownership of resources, sharing of resources between men and women are not only affected by statutory laws and regulations, but also by religious norms and provisions. So there are differences among the Christians and uh, and Muslim communities on how women access land. For Muslims, there are provisions that women may only access one third of the wealth in a family. So these are the issues that you cannot change in a day. They are changed slowly and norms and customs change slowly, particularly when the girl child have access to education. We believe that transformation starts with education and with actions that we call a transformative actions from the household to the community level. So taking a step back and looking at international policy, could you talk about how countries like the US uh, could have a more cooperative uh, policy with African governments and uh, to emphasize uh, something, a greater harmony of interest in a way. So I, I, I guess if you were, sitting at the UN representing Tanzania, uh, what are some of the policies that um, would, would be better in place for international uh, policy? Uh, African countries, Tanzania, South Africa, Mozambique, can learn a lot from uh, the US policies, starting with education, putting in place policies that enhance inclusive education, uh, provide resources to centers that develop thinkers, policymakers. That's where you need to invest. 
So US has done a lot in terms of uh, education policies. Uh, we know in terms of other businesses that Tanz uh, Tanzania can learn investment in uh, innovation and technology. These kind of a policy design that are people-centered, that are innovation-centered, uh, free speech and uh, democracy. These are the policies that uh, can shape thinking in Africa where people are given opportunity to think, people are given opportunity to innovate. Uh, therefore, the oppressive policies that people feel are, are in place in many African countries can be changed by learning from practice of what is working in the US, what is not working, because I believe uh, one of the important policy lessons is that not every policy fits every context. So policies need to learn and modify, uh, modify the such lessons to fit the context that it is intended to be applied. So I wanna talk a little bit about what the US could do to be more cooperative with African governments. And one of the things that I'm very interested in looking into is the amount of corporate taxes that are evaded in a lot of these developing countries. We often celebrate the fact that international development is providing money to countries to help with foreign assistance. And that, according to a 2014 article, is about $80 billion a year. Yet illicit financial flows are worth over $800 billion a year, according to this 2014 United Nations article, urgent global action needed to tackle tax avoidance. Is not only US corporations, but all corporations should make sure that if they're doing business in Africa or elsewhere, that they're actually paying the appropriate rate of taxes and paying the, the personnel and, and labor that they're using at an appropriate level as well with an international floor so that it's not extractive and uh, exploitative. That's something I'm very interested in looking into in the, in the future. I think I can add that a very, that's a very relevant aspect that uh, the cooperation between African countries, Tanzania included and the US could really focus. And I have hope that the Biden administration will look into that. Uh, the government of President Magufuli in Tanzania has been very keen to ensure that investors, big investors in mineral extraction, pay due taxes and invest in local economy. Uh, Tanzania, South Africa, Kenya, our largest destination for tourists from South, uh, South Africa and the largest are Americans. But what we are noticing is that America or US and other countries, they invest in hotels, they invest in transport, but they invest very little in the local economy in the sense that a tourist flying from New York and spending a week or a month in Serengeti, the heart of humanity, may literally spend less than a thousand in the local economy because he or she is sleeping or staying at the infrastructure hotel owned by a New York based investor. So everything is paid in the US and uh, the majority of money ends up in uh, international flights. Maybe the Tanzanian uh, uh, trader who will get money is the one who just has, uh, sold a piece of craft. So these are the kinds of economies that uh, needs a lot of articulation between the host country uh, and also the investor or home-based uh, investor country like US. Uh, these are issues that once resolved, uh, countries may need more of a trade, uh, effective trade rather than assistance because you can earn more from the trade that countries are doing than uh, little dollars that are donated through uh, international assistance. In closing, looking into the future of natural resource governance and land reform policy, where do you see opportunity and hope? Africa, uh, sometimes people feel like uh, uh, it's a doomed continent, but I have a very uh, good hope in Africa. Africa is getting 
uh, young people who are graduating from schools, being in their own countries, the people graduating in Tanzania, but there are also people returning from countries like US. These are people who are shaping policies that the difficulties they're facing, but their impacts are being felt. And uh, Africa has huge opportunity in turning up all the resources it has from land to minerals to forest into good use. And Africa is catching up in terms of technology. People are using social media, people are innovating apps. Information flow is there. What Africa needs is to invest in a good democratic governance that will invest in people rather than material. Invest first in people. Those people will turn their brains and use the infrastructure that is used uh, or developed by their current governments for the development of the people and the people in the continent and the respective councillors. I have no doubt in the next 10, 15, uh, 20 years, some African countries will make greater progress. Ghana is showing the way in terms of democracy and utilizing local resources from changing the colonial school uniforms to adopting locally manufactured and designed school uniforms. Tanzania can do that, South Africa can do that. So I have no doubt with the right assistance, right guidance from African leaders and also with the right assistance and guidance from international community, African people can have a better future.